Global, leading Britain's conversation, The Nigel Farage Show. Well, the news last week that the murder rate in London had overtaken that of New York really got people to sit up and start to think. Not just this side of the pond either. I was on Fox News. I was in America last week and they simply couldn't believe it. And they were asking me, what is going on in London? Well, we did debate that um, a couple of times last week on the Monday to Thursday show. Uh, But here we are. Violent crime rising, not just in London, it's happening. This is not purely a London story, it's happening in other parts of the country too. And I suppose, predictably, we get the government big response today. Amber Rudd writing a piece in the Sunday Telegraph. And what is she going to do? She's going to introduce an offensive weapons bill to restrict access to some of the most offensive and dangerous weapons. This includes certain kinds of knives and acid being sold to miners. She's come up with a serious violence strategy. So there you are. And she's told us it's nothing to do with cuts. It's nothing to do with police numbers. You know, she says a few years ago, police numbers were going up and violent crime rose at the same time. Uh, And she says... On stop and search, let me be crystal clear. I always get really worried when they say, let me be crystal clear. Uh, And she says, you know, it's a vital policy uh, and officers will always have the government's full support to use these powers properly. Isn't that great? So everything's fine, folks. Nothing to worry about. We're going to have new legislation. We're going to have a new serious violence strategy uh, group set up and all will be fine. Oh, really? Well, Amber Rudd, let me be crystal clear with you that actually, under your boss, the Prime Minister, who, of course, was the longest-serving Home Secretary for 150 years, under her, stop and search, fell by, wait for it, 80%. 80%! And the reason was that the ever-politically correct Theresa May did not want it to be seen that possibly if police stop people in certain parts of London or elsewhere, that they could be thought to be racist. And and I'm not making this up. I mean, Cressida Dick, who's the boss of the Metropolitan Police, said uh, that in many cases, police are now afraid to conduct stop and search for fear of being, uh, you know, criticised or called racist. And I uh, made the argument last week, I personally think, uh, that actually political correctness is directly leading to an increase in the murder rate in London and possibly elsewhere. So, given this is what's going to happen, given that it's more legislation, do we really need more laws? Uh, Is Amber Rudd right that actually there are sufficient police on the streets. I want to know what you think. Do you have confidence that the government are going to be able to tackle this escalation in violence? And if you think perhaps uh, setting up a new task force, bringing in new laws is the right approach, then call me on 0345 973 Or maybe like me, you think it's a classic reaction to any of it. More legislation, more government, quangos effectively, and that actually they're not really going to get to grips with it. Text me on 84850. And maybe you think, that dropping stop and search by 80% over that period means rather than blaming Sadiq Khan for all of this and, hey, the fact that he hasn't visited a crime site, the fact that he hasn't spoken to any of the families, I think he's awful. But maybe, actually, the drop in stop and search on a Theresa May is one of the main reasons for this. Let me know what you think. You can tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And, of course, you can watch us on Facebook and you can comment there too. So, you know, there are, without doubt, there are real, genuine problems here. Uh, and I was I was quite alarmed, I have to say, and depressed by some of the phone calls that we took on Thursday, uh, you know, from young people living in boroughs uh, in London where there's an increase in violence who were coming on to my show and saying they themselves now might start carrying knives for fear that so many other people are. And indeed, we even had, didn't we, six stabbings that took place in London in the space of 90 minutes. Now, maybe one way in which this would be a good thing uh, is that if her offensive weapons bill 
actually deals a little bit with punishments because a lot of evidence that people at the moment who are caught carrying acid first time round simply get a warning. They're not actually charged, certainly not given a custodial sentence. That only happens on the second occasion that people are caught. And I do think, I do think that uh, stop and search, I don't see, frankly, what other option we've got. Because even if Amber Rudd is to introduce bans on certain types of knives, what use is that? if there's no means of actually stopping and finding out whether people are carrying them. Uh, is this good enough? Have you got confidence this government is going to tackle all of this? Mark is a new caller to this show from Hounslow, and I'm going to ask him that question. Good morning, Mark. Oh, good morning, Nigel. Listen, it's very simple. The drug business, the cocaine business, is an estimated two billion a year. Yep. I, the drugs, and you take away the dealer's business. If they don't have a business, they don't have a job, they don't have gangs. It's as simple as that. Right, so how do we take away their income? Well, as I just said, legalise drugs. Just legalise everything? Legalize, absolutely, and then pay, if you, and do what you do with alcohol. It's the same as prohibition when, in, with Al Capone. You had gangs going around shooting each other in America. It's prohibition. If you don't legalise the drugs, you'll never learn... It's two billion a year in the hands of the criminals, in the hands of the gangs with the guns and the yeah. knives. Yeah, no, no, I mean, no. Away, legalized drugs. That's the end of it. No, I know that uh, I was in um, Colorado, Mark, uh, last week for a couple of days, where of course they have legalized marijuana. Made me laugh. I was standing outside a building having a cigarette, and someone screamed at me as if I'd done something dreadful. I guess I should have been smoking a joint, and maybe then it would have been okay. I don't know, but I understand the argument about perhaps legalising marijuana. But would you, is, is there a line you would draw, Mark? I mean, would you include Class A drugs? Would you include cocaine? Would you go as far as crack cocaine? Well, cocaine, you can turn it into crack. That, perhaps they yep. should keep that illegal. Who knows? That's the most addictive substance. But people only start taking crack when their lives are all over. Cocaine is currently about, for good grammar coke, it's about 80 quid on the streets. That business is in the hands of those kids running around in gangs. Take it away from them. If they closed down LBC, you'd be out of a job. Take away the business. Right. Okay. I'm not sure, Mark, I get the direct parallel there, but, but that's OK. No, so, so basically, you legalise it, you licence it, you regulate it, and you set it over the counter. And you tax it. Think of the billions in tax. Yeah, no, no, OK, Mark. But even if you did that, do you, and do you think that would literally eradicate gang culture in London today? Well, more or less, you'd probably kill about 90% of it overnight, leaving the marijuana. But obviously you'd have to legalise that as well. You know, it's, it's obvious. There's nothing much more to it. It's exactly the same as Prohibition yep. in the 1920s. Well, in, in, in a way, Amber Rudd does, in her article identify this because she says we need to shine a light on the drug trade um, which is a key driver of rising violence so she identifies a very similar problem to you Mark I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain she doesn't advocate uh, the legalisation of any of it but Mark you've made a very very interesting point and I thank you for making it and Mark saying so much of this is all to do with crime and money is about the drugs trade, and I know a lot, a lot of people do think that. Um, Ashish is calling from Croydon. Good morning. Yes, hello, good morning. Um, I think there should be a two-pronged attack on, on this, and maybe a different approach. Okay. First of all, uh, we need to satirise this Ali G disease, this Ali G culture, which a lot of not only black youth, but white youth and Asian youth are doing. I mean, I've got nephews, and they went through a phase where when I'd take a picture of them, they used to put these finger signs up and go, yeah, West Side. And I go, where the hell did you learn that? And they, wanted to wear, they wanted to wear these baggy trousers which show their backside. And, yeah. you know, they were talking like, you know, black gangsters. And I said, why are you acting like that? That's not you. You're just an Ali G. And I kept on calling them Ali G, Ali G. And then they stopped doing it. You know, this Ali G disease... Oh, you, well, maybe you've effect. cracked it. I mean, there you are. Well, <laughs> well, we need to take the mick out of it, but this, this is, there is another point. But we need 
to take the mick out of this alley because it's not only black kids and Indian kids who are born here. A lot of these new refugees are coming here. They obviously come in and settle, and then you start seeing them with their baseball caps and their baggy trousers and trying to talk like that. You know, we need to make fun of this allergy disease before it infects everybody. Okay, That's maybe may, maybe worse than that, Ashish. Yeah. It, have yeah. you listened? To some of the lyrics of these rap records i have because because what it is you have uh, combination songs where you have a singer and a rap and the singer sings so beautifully and then you hear the rap <laughs> like he's like he's ha- having a go at his mum but i mean some of the things that are advocated in these songs are pretty scary stuff isn't it well, they they just you know what it is It's immaturity. You know they they watch all these program these films right. like from right. from New York from yeah. New York yeah. right and they just want to they all want to be they want to act like Black American African American right. so satirize yeah. them okay and your yeah. second prong Ashish second point I mean, is you you that, clearly you know, are a radical in all of this so I can't wait for this one well you you've heard we've talked a bit about grooming gangs uh, yes. and you you in the past so yes. you must know that you know you've got to do something radical otherwise these people who get these five six five six figured sums you know in important play you know important positions trying to solve this problem they're just a waste of money you know what i mean <laughs> that's the first thing the right. second the second thing is that um you know if the government is afraid of doing stop and search increasingly of black youth they need to say to these black youth look we are saving black lives. Black Absolutely. lives matter. Yep. Black lives matter. Yep. That's why we are. Do you know what? Because it's not. It's not white guys killing these black. If, youth. if, if it's you not look, Asian guys, it's Ashish, black killing black. If you look at the victims in London so far this year, you are absolutely right. The vast, vast majority of the victims are members of the ethnic communities. Ashish, great phone call. Thank you for that. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's now 11.15. As the London murder rate overtakes that of New York and shocks everybody, uh, we can rest assured it's all going to be OK because Amber Rudd has written an article in the Sunday Telegraph and there's going to be more legislation. Yes, there'll be an offensive weapons bill but perhaps even more excitingly there's going to be a serious violence strategy task force set up so there we are it'll all be sorted oh no it won't you know when she goes on later in this article to say let me be crystal clear oh yeah and that she's saying stop and search is a vital policy tool and officers will always have the government's full support to use these powers properly. This from a Conservative government who, from 2010, under the stewardship of Theresa May as Home Secretary, have seen stop and search fall by 80% because they don't want anyone to say that they're being racist, uh, despite the fact, as our previous caller made, most of the victims are black, so the argument for stop and search is that it will save black lives. But don't expect anyone like Amber Rudd to tread on turf like that. It's too awkward, too difficult and much too embarrassing. Do you have confidence that a new task force and a new piece of legislation will deal with this problem? I do not. Piers says on Facebook, under Boris, London was safe. I think he's a terrible person and an atrocious foreign secretary, but he was a good mayor. Um, and he says, uh, ex-army men should be paid good money to become police officers with guts to handle these morons who think they are gangsters. Uh, Rob says, more coppers doesn't cut the number of stabbings and murders. And this is a point that Amber Rudd makes. She says, none of this is because there are fewer police than there were a couple of decades ago, that, that it's not to do with budgets. She, she, she is saying, actually, you can have rising police and rising crime. Well, of course you can. But I, I don't know. I, I, uh, did you see in the week David Lammy from Tottenham saying that actually there simply weren't enough police on the streets? And to the embarrassment of the poor man, just as he was being filmed saying that, a policeman walked behind in shot of the camera. But Lammy was making a serious point that he didn't think police were visible enough on the streets of Tottenham. Tottenham, where a couple of those murders have taken place. Emily is calling from Hartford. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Nigel. It's an honour to speak to you. Well, that's very sweet of you. Now, do you think that we've got this cracked because Amber Rudd is setting up a serious violent strategy task force? Does that fill you with confidence to think that violent Not crime will be... tackled? I've got no faith in this government whatsoever. No. Really? Yes. We we need a leader like Trump or you. 
How do you think... Dra- anyway, I know, okay. that's not the topic of conversation. So what I'm going to say is basically there's a few bullet points here. Yep. First of all, we need to address the breakdown of the family unit in these communities. And we need to bring back national service. We need to legalise drugs. And with the stop and search, you need to just be able to stop whoever you want if there's any suspicion. When are you, um, Emily, when are you running for Parliament? Well, Nigel, I'd absolutely love to, but... <laughs> Unfortunately, I just don't have money to start my own campaign. Right, well, there is a new party being set up with perhaps 50 million quid, and they're looking for new ideas, so you never know. Emily, I listen, I, I'm taking the mickey a bit, but I do understand exactly what... I do understand what you're saying, that we do need to get a lot tougher. Do you know something? You, you, you know, Trump, you mentioned, but do you remember a guy called Rudy Giuliani? No! Right, Rudy... And I know Rudy. Rudy Giuliani became mayor of New York... Um, in the late 1990s. And he pursued a brand new policing policy in New York, and it was called the broken windows theory. And what it was, if a street has got broken windows and graffiti and litter, there is more likely, because of the whole appearance of it, to attract bad people and to attract crime. So he dealt with problems in New York from the bottom up by smartening the place up, by having community policing. He himself, as the mayor of New York, was seen out in these districts with the police and he put in place a really tough policy. And, you know, one man, one man as mayor of New York radically transformed safety on the streets in New York. And, Emily, it's called leadership. It's called Absolutely. real leadership. You know, and and I frankly, we're not getting leadership from Neither Sadiq Khan, not. from Sadiq Khan of any kind at all. And if the best Amber Rudd can do is to give us more legislation and a serious violent strategy task force, we're not going in the right direction, are we? Absolutely not, Nigel. I'm sick of it. When are you coming back? All we'll have to say about that, Emily. Um, I'm watching Brexit very carefully. I'm watching it like a hawk. Uh, but uh, no immediate desire to get back into the front line of politics. But Well, you're very much missed, Nigel. We all love you. And when you come back, I shall be signing up to join the party. Right. Very good, Emily. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> well, there we are. Um, I guess, you know, I do attract some supporters and some detractors. Hey, that's life, isn't it? Extra police will not get rid of knife crime. The trouble is, uh, we all are becoming a wanted straightaway society. And these people that do the crimes see on pop vids and films lots of money and fame. And in a sick way, that is what they want, says Ian. Ian, we had two phone calls on Thursday from people saying, actually, one of the reasons people do knifings, do stabbings, is it makes them famous. And it's very worrying. And Ian, you're right. And you know, I'm being told that education is the answer, but hey, to get to, to get a fundamental change in behaviour through the education system is going to take five to ten years. The question is, what do we do now? And it does seem to me that through political correctness and through cutting stop and search, we have made the problem worse, not better. Better. Nigel Amberrud is like the captain of the Titanic, rearranging the deck chairs, says Laura from Shenfield in Essex. I'm going to go to Wilford to Zishan. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Nigel. So, Uh, do you have more confidence than I do in Amberrud and the government in dealing with this rapid growth of violent crime? The thing is, I don't think that's going to be dealt, Nigel. And I just want to make one point. The argument with the glass to legalising drugs, that's a yeah. flawed argument. I'm not going to go into that. I just want to say two things, really, on that point. First point is this. I'm fed up when Telford happens, when something, you know, in London happens. This excuse of, oh, you know what, because we're going to be branded racist or because of political correctness, they don't do their job properly. I'm an Asian British and I'm saying this, that... This, these are just excuses. These are like excuses when I'm a teacher and, you know, kids come up, oh, that teacher's being racist, but it's in fact the kid not doing his job properly and just using an excuse. So what I want to say is this. If you're going to get a police force that isn't diverse enough and what you get is 95% of the time a white male stop and searching an ethnic minority or someone from another area, of course the first scenario thing you're going to create is, of, oh, are they being racist? Why haven't we made our force diverse enough, at least in London? so that this stigma is removed. Well, they are trying. They are trying, Zeeshan, to make the force uh, more diverse. I I don't think so, Nigel, because I'll tell you why. I was at a point training as a police cadet in my young days. Now, when I was there, um, the kind of 
um, the, the way the post was, I didn't feel welcomed enough. And I'm telling you, I was a 16, 17-year-old who was absolutely passionate about joining the force. Um, and I just didn't feel welcomed enough. And I, know, I mean, this is not going long back. This is going back to, I don't know, 2009, which is not long back, just say. No, it isn't. It's not welcoming enough for ethnic minorities. In, uh, uh, Zisha, c- can you just explain... Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you've made the point. Can you explain yeah. in what way you didn't feel welcome? Well, I mean, like I said, my experience, that it was, like, like I said, it's, it's, it's a bit hard to explain when you're down there. I mean, you sort of, um, I don't know if you remember, but around that time, there was a documentary by a journalist that was released, and he basically recorded the insides of the, of the police force and, and, and how, you know, it was institutionally racist. It was in 2006, 2007, a journalist had perpetrated the uh, police force. Mm. And which issued like you know um, inside recordings of how the police may be and what kind, what's the racism like inside the police. So that was really uncomfortable. And then to sort of see things when, I'll be honest, where a white male was prepared for certain opportunities when it came to representing the team at certain events, etc. I, I did feel that way that the preference was right. uh, white so, male, female, so, rather than. So Zishan, if. Yes. If the Met, I mean, we're talking London now, but hey, the same principle, yeah. the same principle would apply to any big cities across the UK. If the Met was to employ, and, and, and not, you know, on, on the basis of positive discrimination, but on merit, if the Met was to employ Absolutely. some really tough black police officers to go and deal with these gangs in no uncertain terms, the cry of racism couldn't be made, but would it help solve the problem? I think it would. Reason why, um, Nigel, is because I personally feel if a youth was, and, and, and I've done youth work and I know how it works, to be honest, the way a black youth worker would approach a child and get information out of them, understanding, you know, what the situation is, understanding maybe the cultural differences, even the language of the lingo that, you know, um, you grow up with and you're kind of familiar with common connections, they are a lot more effective. It's just like, you know, the way you guys, we, we talk about um, terrorism. Yeah. It's a community project. Communities have to bring forward intelligence. Communities have to connect with people to get this result. Now, th- this is my point. If there was, let's say, a, 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 I mean, on merit, a fair representation yeah. of black, yeah. Yeah. Asian... No, 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 no. Zeeshan, listen, I've listened to what you have to say, and I think you may well be right. Maybe, maybe, in these areas, in these areas where we've got real problems, an aggressive stop-and-search policy by a police force that representative of the area would be much, much tougher for the bad guys to criticise and condemn. And, of course, it's the bad guys that will criticise and condemn because they want to go on running their gangs and running their illegal activities, and they will encourage everybody to use racism as an excuse. That is not a defence for, a, you know, an 80% fall in the use of stop and search, that, in my opinion, is because of very weak, very gutless politicians. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, and it's now 11.30. Has Amber Rudd convinced you that this government is going to tackle serious, violent crime head-on and solve things by bringing in an offensive weapons bill and setting up a serious violence strategy task force? I'm not convinced but perhaps I've got it wrong. Meanwhile, today, a rolling series of protests taking place around the United Kingdom. Milford Haven, Newcastle, Plymouth, Portsmouth, Hastings and Whitstable. This is being organised by Fishing for Leave. You'll remember their last protest outside uh, the House of Commons on the River Thames, dumping back some over-quota haddock, which I gave them a hand with, um, and today they're protesting very strongly indeed. It isn't just our commercial fishermen, our anglers are protesting too, because under Brussels rules, they're not allowed to take a single bass home for tea. So this is an industry, both the pleasure angling and commercial fishing, that is in serious decline, and of course the government has said, when we leave the European Union on March the 29th next year, nothing will change for at least 21 months. And the fishing industry and the coastal communities who voted Brexit by a big margin feel very badly let down and they're angry. And I will myself be going along to Whitstable later on today to support the Kent fishermen's protest. Back to our subjects. Andy is calling from Enfield. Andy, good morning. Hi, Nigel. How are you? I'm all right. So are you convinced that, Ter- that, that Amber Rudd has got the message and is now going to tackle this rise in violent crime head on? 
Absolutely not. Amber Rudd doesn't have a clue. It's not so much as a lot of people say that the Met is incompetent or the police are incompetent, but that's not the case. You have to look at what their objectives really are. When it comes to, say, stopping something like hate crime or stopping someone like, um, like the recent case of stopping Martin Sauner at the border, they're very effective. They're very effective. <laughs> but it's just you have, to, you have to see what their objectives really are. And if you, if you think their objectives are solving crime, keeping the streets safe, that's a bunch of nonsense. Also, I'd just like to remark on uh, the previous call. I think it was uh, Shishan, Shishan, yep. saying we need more, more diverse. Yep. Yeah, Shishan. We need the police force, especially I think he was talking about the Met, to be more reflective of um, communities, in, yeah. you know, especially in London. Yeah. But we've already tried this. Like, Even if you were to put, say, more Asian cops or, like you said, some tough black cops into the Met, then the people who are making these complaints, then they're just going to say, oh, they're just puppets. These people really don't have our interests at heart. They're just working for whoever, the white man, the establishment. And so this, they're still, they're still going to be complaining. I, think, I don't think we should be appeasing these people at all. I think what we need, what, like you said before, what we need is leadership. And what we need to do is take a tough line. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, Andy, this is what Giuliani did in New York with very, very dramatic results. Um, and your comments about hate crime, well, you know, in the past, the Metropolitan Police have, have championed very loudly the fact that they have 900 officers working on hate speech and exactly. hate crime. Yeah. And, Andy, to be fair, some of the hate speech and hate crime is pretty nasty stuff that does really upset wound and offend people uh, but it is all about course, priorities yeah. andy isn't it and i would yes, have thought course, yeah. i would have thought people being stabbed in an increasing number was actually more important uh, than some groups in society criticizing and condemning others that would certainly be my view so andy i'd back up your view and i thank you very much indeed for your call more police i get on twitter won't stop the fact the youth have no respect for anyone in authority or even themselves and kate makes a point she says the stop and search was not intelligence led so out of 10 stops and search, only one was charged with an offence. Kate, I'm going to take that argument you've just made to me and turn it upside down and say, if for every 10 people that were stopped, one was carrying a knife, that's a hell of a good ratio. Hell of a good ratio. So um, if, 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 if you're right, Kate, with those numbers, I'd go for mass stop and search tomorrow morning all over London. I really really would. Steve is calling from Islington. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, uh, Nigel. Nice to speak to you, mate. I think you've done the best thing for this country with Brexit for a long, long while. Well, thank you for that, but but, uh, <laughs> but I've, anyway, the, I've solved nothing on knife man. crime, Steve, and I, you know, I, I, I'm sort of thinking that our political leaders aren't doing enough to solve knife crime. Honestly, I mean, come on. You know, when politicians announce more legislation and more groups and committees, we We've got enough laws in place already. We've got a police force. You know, I just don't believe a word of it is no. going to improve anything, Steve. No, Nigel, anyway, back to the guy before the news about employing more you know, ethnic yes. minorities. Yes. Honestly, mate, it doesn't work. I've seen incidents myself in, say, like Acne in Kingsland Road when a black officer has been involved in an incident outside the station or whatever. Yeah. He's actually got stick from his own like, own people, and white officers have had to step in to protect him. It doesn't work, Nigel. They won't accept it. What do you say they won't accept it, Steve? What precisely do you mean by that? I mean, well, coloured people won't accept even their own people joining the police force. It's they, not... they just ostracise them. I, Steve, it's not as bad as that, surely. It is as bad as that, Nigel. I've seen it myself in Kingsland Road, which is often is a very populated coloured area. When a, a black officer has been involved in an incident, he has absolutely got slaughtered from his own people, and white officers have had to literally push him back to protect him. So, if, if a white police officer uh, conducts stop and search against somebody from the ethnic minorities, despite the fact, ultimately, it's the ethnic minorities themselves that are being protected by this, they get criticised. You're saying if a black police officer arrests somebody, he's going to get criticised. So, Steve, tell me something. Tell me something. What the hell do we do? I don't know, mate, but what you just said earlier is I'm like you. I did absolutely have stop and search right across the board. Yep. Absolutely. It's the only way, because all these putting people putting up excuses, 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 it's not going to work. People are still going to get stabbed and shot. 
Yeah. No, something's got to be done. Steve, I thank you for the call. Uh, Russ says to me via text, Amber Rudd, just a soundbite. There is sufficient legislation to deal with weapons. Uh, we have uh, we have deals for gang-related matters. Some boroughs already have serious and violent crime units. She is just spouting what she thinks we want to hear. Russ, that gets it for me. I couldn't agree more. Nick is calling from Croydon. Good morning, Nick. Uh, hello, Nigel. Morning to you. Um, stop and search must be used, and those people in the media, in Parliament, in in our uh, government, who've been stopping stop and search, and I include MP David uh, Lammy in this, should hold their hands in their, their their heads in shame. David Lammy MP, as recently as January this year, yep. complained at Mayor Sadiq Khan about the amount amount of 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 stop and search, particularly on on black people within his area. As recently, Nigel, as January this year, reference Google Online, uh, Guardian Online, via, via, via... All right, no, Google I believe you, I believe you. I know, no, Nick, I believe so, you, I believe you. So, 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 so one minute Lamb is criticising the police for stop and search, the next minute he says there aren't enough police on the streets. That's your point about Lamy, yeah? It, it is, yes, and it's pathetic. I mean, the media have got a, got a, a role in this, too. The, re, the media, particularly political media should actually challenge these guys on this. But they come on TV and are allowed to say this rubbish without any let or hindrance, challenge or argument. It's just not not good enough. It encourages and, and excuses people for, frankly, bad, you know, criminal, murderous activities on our streets. There are some, Nick, who example, say... Would you, Nick, would you, Nick, there are some you? who say... There are some who say that if there was a substantial increase in stop and search, it would lead to a widening gap between the ethnic communities and the police force. How would you respond to that? What would that uh, those 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 are folks rather have dead people or or a hurt feelings? It's really that simple. Well, I tell you what, you put that beautifully, Nick. I thank you very much indeed for your call. Richard says an offensive weapons bill should include offensive music. I get the point, Richard, in terms of the lyrics in many of these songs. Surely the police should target the gang leaders. The rest would then fall apart, says David from Dartford. More support from Boris. Marjorie says on Twitter, Boris was a very good mayor for London. But he's a disaster as far as secretary. Support for Boris. And an important point here that Vidal from Streatham is making. In the period that Theresa May reduced stop and search by 80%, violent crime dropped. So something else is going on here. Stop and search is not the reason why stabbings and shootings have increased. Right, OK. In the early years of Theresa May's tenure as Home Secretary, overall national serious crime figures were coming down. For a brief period, they then started to rise. There has been, and, you know, I, as I've said time and again, it's London at the moment we're talking about, but these principles can apply to any of the big cities across the United Kingdom. We have had a 40% increase in knife crime in London over the last 10 years, overlapping, not quite, but almost perfectly, with a period during which stop and search has been reduced by 80%. And as I say, I'm highly unimpressed by Sadiq Khan's leadership in this issue. Uh, but equally, we shouldn't forget the role Theresa May played in all of this, and that is just the truth. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 11.45. It's election day in Hungary today. Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister, seeking a third term in office. He is very, very likely to win a big chunk of the vote. And the far-right Jobbik party, people who I saw, turning up in the European Parliament in 2014 after their first few members were elected. And guess what? They turned up on day one in military uniforms. I'm not making it up. Uh, and they're likely to do pretty well in these elections too. And a very, very good piece by Robert Hardman in the Daily Mail yesterday, the new schism, and it is a brilliant analysis, one with which I agree 100%. He says, forget Brexit. Fed up with mass immigration 
and being treated as populist morons by a bullying Brussels, the leaders of four countries are threatening to tear the EU asunder. And he's talking about the leaders of the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland and Hungary, the Visegrad group, um, as they're known. Indeed, Andrew Marr said not so long ago, that the leaders of those four countries, when they talk about Brussels, make Nigel Farage sound like a foreign office diplomat. Um, and perhaps one of the reasons, and Robert Harbin does point this out, one of the reasons why they are a complete nightmare from Brussels is none of them want to leave the European Union. No, they want to stay and destroy it from within. And it's really ironic, in a way, uh, that Viktor Orban's Hungary is still in receipt of EU funds whilst at the same time condemning the place in language that I don't think I've ever used. So I tell you what, they're a major, I do think that the EU actually is going through stages now of complete dislocation. That's a debate for another show. But let's watch, let's see what those results are in Hungary today. And we'll certainly chat about them at 7 o'clock tomorrow night uh, when I'm back here on LBC. Listening to at Nigel underscore Farage on at LBC, I find myself agreeing quite a bit with him, especially on Boris Johnson and crime in London, says Matt. Thank you, Matt. It's very good of you. Stop and search should be performed with body cam recording yes then any complaints about the police could be reviewed peter in lansing yes 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 they've got the technology haven't they within the hats or helmets for the whole thing to be recorded i agree with you and you know that 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 is what needs to be done um, i get also on text if one in ten are found with a weapon on them then after a thousand people are searched that's a hundred people caught and that could mean a hundred lives saved says nick yeah nick as i say when kate earlier on said if this doesn't work only one in ten are carrying a knife i thought wow 10 percent is a seriously big hit rate seamus is calling from watford good morning seamus yeah hi nigel hi um I, i've listened to the debate um yeah. And, uh, you know, I worked on the Tottenham High Road in the mid-90s, so I know the area. Yes. And what I would say is, you know, and I remember the Cynthia Jarrett affair, I remember the Mark Duggan situation. Yes. And I think with this hardball, Capone-style attack, which I think the Tories are going to impose now, and I could see it going off again. I could see riots, riots going afoot, because what you'll probably end up seeing, and I'm, not, I'm only giving you my view, you know, um, an oppressive white society versus disaffected black youth. And... Uh, you know, I, I do say it with a heavy heart and a, and a great element of foreboding, but I can I can just see it going off again. So, um, okay, so you are concerned. I I did put this argument earlier on. Didn't say I believed in it, but I did put this argument early on. You believe that if stop and search was to be significantly increased in these in these areas, that would lead to increased alienation. Absolutely, and I, I think you'll get the likes of, or well, you've got Lammy coming out, and you've got Diane Abbott coming out. Um, to probably talking about more getting more police on the street, but what will happen if they do come out? They start arresting people, probably rightfully so, um, uh, and then, then there's some kind of kickback. I mean, I, but Seamus, Seamus, you're in the next situation, but, Nigel. But Seamus, to willfully back off policing each area to to as much as we can, equal standards, regardless whether they're areas of high ethnic communities or not to start saying oh do you know what that's an ethnic um, th th that's an ethnic minority area 40 percent there are ethnic minorities let's not bother to police that too heavily in case we're criticized whilst tolerating an increasing murder rate in that area wouldn't that be a complete abdication of responsibility absolutely i, I don't disagree with you nigel but what i'm saying is i'm mm. just telling you what i think may happen mm. so oh. and uh, so what i'm saying is they've got to have some kind of backup plan to deal deal with that situation if it does occur um i mean it's chicken and egg that's what well, i'm saying sobering and you, and you, words Shane. And, and then you could hop back and I, I don't want to dwell on it but that robert hardman article you talked about yesterday yes i, I read it yes i read it myself yes and you could talk about the deleterious effects of long-term uh, mass unfettered unrestricted unrequested immigration so I'm, <laughs> I'm not saying i'm right i'm just saying you potentially could could, could make an argument on that point
Well, I mean, you know, none of us want to see the Brixton riots happen again. 1981 was a pretty scary time in South London. um, And, of course, those riots took place in Bristol and Birmingham and many other parts of the UK as well. We don't want to go back to that. But, Seamus, I think the point that was made earlier and one that I agree with, uh, that actually stop and search would save black lives. And that's the argument the police and my government need to use, in my view. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm just saying that there there might be some fallout. Yeah, no, no, you've you've given us the warning, Seamus. I hear you. I very, very much hope you're wrong. But I thank you very much indeed for calling in. Uh, Morning, Nigel. In the 50s, I remember a copper on nearly every street corner uh, with fewer police. Well, yeah, but Mick, they weren't busy filling in form after form after form and wrapped up in bureaucracy. Perhaps they were able to actually do their jobs. If anybody was a policeman who's seen the change in that culture over the years, please call me on 0345 60 60 973. The problem is not stop and search and a lack of police or ethnic minority groups joining the police. It is the CPs who are not enforcing our knife laws. CPS, sorry, who are not enforcing our knife laws. We already have, says Louise. Louise, I don't think we need any more legislation. We've got loads. Every time something appears to be a crisis, the government says, let's have more laws. Tell you what, what about enforcing the ones that we have at the moment? Catherine's calling from Stevenage. Good morning. Now, I've lost her. Yvonne is calling from... Beckley. Yvonne, hello. Hi, good morning, Nigel. Good morning. I'm a first-time caller. I've never spoken to you before. Well, welcome. Um, I, 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 I am n- not in favour. Obviously, we know what's happening here is abhorrent. It's disgraceful. It's horrendous. However, I would like to have to think about some of the causes of this situation. There's no justification for anyone walking around with a gun or a knife and shooting or killing or stabbing anyone. However, I think we're spending too much time thinking about how to crack this nut without looking at some of the causes and the effects. I think that is rooted in the young people feeling alienated, and this is not just ethnic minority people. I think young people in general are feeling that they are not part of this society. We do not have positive images of young people in the media. They're always portrayed as um, gang-loving, um, horrible music. I think we really need to think about how years of possible um, social, social exclusion, poverty, um, Cutting in youth services has affected young people. They do not feel like they are part of the society. They feel alienated and they've created their own subculture, which is abhorrent. And I think that we are are making, we uh, as a community, uh, you know, we want to build more prisons. We want to have another task force. We want to punish them. We want to make them suffer. We want to make them pay. We want to, yes, we should do stop and search. Yes, we should, people should be paying if they they commit heinous crimes. However, we need to do... This is a multifaceted problem and we need multifaceted approaches to dealing with it. I don't disagree, Yvonne, with what you've said, but, my, but, but you know, my problem is that dealing with the long-term causes of the alienation of segments of society and, and, and attempting that through the education system and everything else, the trouble is, Yvonne, all of that, all of that would take many, many years to actually get a decent result. I well, want to, I'm, not, I'm know, not suggesting that, that I, I appreciate that. Obviously, mm, this situation mm. did not occur overnight. This has been something that has been brewing. This, this, is, this is something that has been brewing for years, decades even. Yeah, yeah. So we, obviously, when you have a cancer, a cancer doesn't... You just see the, the, the symptom of the cancer. You don't realise that maybe your poor eating habits, maybe your lifestyle has cultivated this cancer in you and now you have a postulating boil and you want it to be cut out. Really, people have been taught, actually, if we look at our diet, if we look at our behaviours, if we look at the alcohol we drink, then maybe that's you know, the way forward, and it's going to take years. But I, I just think alongside all of the other tactics, people who are in this entrenched, because a lot of the young people that I talk to, who I've worked with, they feel that they have no option but to carry a knife. They feel well, that they have no... They, they do problem. you know, Yvonne, what really worried me last week were, you know, the one particular call I had last week from somebody saying, knife crime is growing in my area, I've now decided I'm going to start carrying a knife to protect myself. And what, I, what I worry about, Yvonne, is this seems to be escalating. Well, the thing is, we are not the young people. We are not the ones walking in the street. I work in an area in, 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 in East London, mm-hmm. um, in Forest Gate, where young people feel that if they do not arm themselves, yeah. they will become victims 
victims. Yeah. And it's okay for, for the powers that be to say, yes, stop and search, incarcerate them, but you might have some poor, timid child who is frightened for his life, yeah. who is walking the streets in fear of going from one postcode or from one street corner to another street corner, who may carry a knife out of yeah, fear. Yeah, no, no, don't. And, I, and I, I, I tell you what. incarcerated his whole career, his whole life, put in a mire because he wanted to protect himself. No, no. Yvonne, it's, we, Yvonne you've, you've identified some real problems here, and, and, and that this escalation is what I fear. Dawn says, finally, I can remember being scared of the police. The police now appear the ones who are scared. You're not wrong. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back tomorrow at 7. At 3 this afternoon, it's Andrew Castle. Up next, Majid Nawaz. Thank you, Nigel.